As an LDS general authority and official church historian, Marlon K. Jensen presided over a historic shift toward greater openness in the Mormon church's approach to its history. You know, truth is a knowledge of things as they were and as they are and as they are to come. And the Holy Ghost testifies of truth. Uh, he speaks of things as they really are and as they really will be. I believe that. I believe the best antidote we have for anyone's faith crisis is to tell the whole story and lay it out the way it, you know, the way it happened, the way we, th we think it happened, the best, to the best of our knowledge. We will share an intimate glimpse into Elder Jensen's personal life, which has been shaped by tragedy, humility, deep faith and devoted service. Join Terrell Givens for this very personal conversation with Elder Marlon Jensen. Hello and welcome to the first installment of Conversations with Terrell Givens, a podcast series uh, sponsored by the Faith Matters Foundation and devoted to the exploration of the experience of lived Mormonism as a catalyst to the abundant life and the public good. And I'm delighted to have with us today one of my dear friends, uh, Elder Marlon Jensen, past church historian and 70 emeritus. Thank you for coming. My honor, Daryl. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, Elder Jensen, you're one of the most uh, well-known and beloved faces in Mormonism and probably have been ever since the PBS documentary on the Mormons of some years back. But for those who aren't familiar with, with you and your past record of service in the church, uh, give us a quick summary of, of how your obituary might read, if that's not too morbid a way to think about how you might be remembered. <laughs> well, I always hoped it would say he died of significance, whatever that means. <laughs> uh, I think it would uh, probably point out that I'm the fifth generation uh, farmer in a little valley in northern Utah. I think it would make reference to my wife of 50 years as of a week ago. And Congratulations. Our, thank you. And our eight children, and now 31 grandchildren. And it would have some reference, I suppose, to my church service. Um, I was uh, very blessed, I thought, to be among the first teachers of German at the language training mission when I returned from my mission. And I've always viewed that as one of my choicest church experiences. But later I became a member of a bishopric when I was going to law school at the University of Utah. And then uh, when we graduated and went back to this little valley where we live, I was asked to be the bishop of our ward at age 28. Uh, my wife Kathy actually went into labor during the meeting that I was being <laughs> installed in <laughs> and missed the whole ceremony. And you missed hers. And I, yes. <laughs> Luckily, it turned out to be false, and she went oh, back okay. a week later, and I was, I was there. So uh, later, I became the president of the first stake in that little valley, the Huntsville, Utah stake, at age 36. And then uh, served about nine years and served uh, for three years as a regional representative, an office now defunct in the church. And then at 46, in the spring of 1989, I was asked to be a member of the First Quorum of 70 and served there for about 24 and a half years and enjoyed some wonderful assignments. Uh, I think the two that I enjoyed most, or the three maybe, being a mission president for a two-year period in Rochester, New York, uh, being in the area presidency uh, and eventually area president in the Central European area, and then uh, serving for the last eight years of my service as the church historian and recorder. So that's a brief overview. I've done some civic things along the way, been on a school board, and I'm doing some things now with intergenerational poverty that I enjoy. But mainly at this stage, I just turned 75, I'm trying to be a good husband, a good father, and a good grandpa. <laughs> That's where I am in life. Good. Well, we want to come back, and we're probably going to talk a good bit about your service as church historian, but I want to talk a little bit more about your own spiritual upbringing. Um, the poet William Wordsworth wrote a poem about his own life in which he said, there are in our existence spots of time. Hmm 
and he went on to say that these moments of time uh, in our past are transformative, shaping moments that determine who we become spiritually and intellectually. Can you think of two or three such moments in your life that, that shaped your future? It's a searching question, Terrell. You know, I think uh, the first would have been the fact that two years before I was born, my mother gave birth to my older brother, Gary, who is now 77 years old and who, because of oxygen deprivation at birth, has only attained uh, the mental age of about a five or six year old. He and I were raised sort of in tandem. After my birth, there was a hiatus of about 10 years before my parents <laughs> ventured to have another child, which may say something about me. <laughs> but uh, being raised with that special brother at a time when there was very little provision in uh, the church, in public education, in society generally for what we now you know, call special needs children, um, observing his treatment at the hands of other young people, trying to come to his aid, uh, watching my parents devote their life, their resources to his enlargement as a person. Uh, I think at a very young age that became one of the most defining parts of my development. I've always <laughs> been a softy when it comes to those who are different. And I think it began with my brother, and it remains. Uh, we share within our family uh, giving him care now that my parents are gone. And uh, I've been blessed, I think, to have just a little look into the eternities about the person he will one day be. And it makes me very grateful that I've been nice to him. And I'm always uh, desirous of uh, being that way throughout his life because I think he was given to us that we might learn things that we would have otherwise never learned. So this is beautiful. So your, your path to discipleship didn't begin with an idea. It didn't begin with a doctrine. It didn't begin with a message you heard. It began with, with a human gesture of love and nurturing for a disadvantaged individual. I think, I know doctrine is a powerful force. I know uh, it can change behavior. But I think uh, having your heartstrings pulled on at any age, but especially at a young age, by something as sympathetic as I've described, is, um, is a very change-producing moment in time. Were there others that followed that? Uh, you know, I think uh, being raised in a small community, I went through the first nine years of school with the same 33 students. Interestingly, we had a... Still friends at the end of it? Yes. <laughs> and in fact, we had a class reunion not long ago, our 55th or whatever it was from a junior high graduation, and of the 33, there are about six or seven that have passed away, but all but two of the rest of them came, which kind of showed, I think, the wow. unity and closeness that we had. But uh, growing up in a rural community with that small group of young people, um, and then suddenly in, at the time of high school being exposed to a high school of 2,000 students, um, there was something about, I, it's, it's difficult to describe, and I don't want to be the least bit self-laudatory, but I came out of that very, what we would call today, backward upbringing. In junior high, we had the same three teachers all three years, for instance. And I, I didn't bring you know, any exceptional abilities. I didn't feel to life. I wasn't a great athlete. I was average. I did have some musical talent. Uh, I actually studied the cornet for 12 years, but I didn't particularly enjoy that because everyone was cheering for the athletes, not the musicians. <laughs> so. <laughs> and intellectually, uh, you know, I felt like I was uh, above average and 
uh, and motivated to learn. I'd had a father who didn't go to college and mother as well, but they always provided good books. And my dad was a very progressive farmer. He subscribed to all the journals. And uh, so I was motivated, I think, in, in that way to learn. But uh, being exposed then in high school and eventually on my mission to Germany, and then coming back to a university setting, uh, that whole transition was very um, formative, I think, in the, in the person that I became, because I, I always held um, people like you in high esteem, uh, but I never thought, for instance, that I would be associating with them or a part of anything that they would be doing. I felt much um, smaller in my expectations for my life. So that, that, that sense, not of worthlessness, but just of being tentative and, uh, and yet being hopeful and then growing through those years and finding that with effort, I found that work was a great equalizer, uh, that I could, you know, uh, compete and operate in the same spheres that really talented, gifted people were operating. That has been uh, a very rewarding and I think uh, formative part of my life. I haven't expressed it very well, but that's certainly one of those moments stretched over several years that has made me into whatever I am. The, these two experiences that you relate remind me of uh, one of the great poems by Gerard Manley Hopkins. <clears throat> it's a poem about the Christ, and it ends with these words, Christ plays in 10,000 places, lovely in limbs and lovely in eyes, not his, to the Father, through the features of men's faces. Mm. And it, it strikes me that these two formative experiences both involve community. They involve uh, your peers and your family. Um, have you, early in life or in years succeeding, been driven to a point where you needed or sought out a more personal experience of, of, uh, of the divine? Definitely. Um, for me, it, I think, uh, began as I thought seriously about serving a mission. I mean, I was raised in a little Mormon village. My father had been the bishop. My grandfather had been the bishop. Uh, it was expected that I would be a good Mormon boy, and I, I, I generally speaking, was. Um, some of those people I went to school with for nine years could relate some experiences that would bear on that. But uh, I always had, for some reason, Terrell, I always had a desire to be I don't know how to describe it, just honest, solid, uh, true as a person. And I've always been bothered by hypocrisy and, and pretension. And so when it came time to seriously consider my mission, I wanted to be able to uh, represent to the people that I knew I would be going to that I, I had a conviction of what I was teaching. And that's where I think I, I first began to grapple with my relationship with God. And um, I, I tried, you know, the traditional approaches to read and to, to ponder and to make my prayers as sincere as they could be, but I didn't ever really... I had some spiritual impressions. I remember at age 12 reading the Joseph Smith story, maybe for the first time in the Pearl of Great Prize and feeling a, a wave or a wash of spirit come over me. And uh, I can think of two or three other times, some of them associated with the formal church, some of them just in my own life, usually in nature. We, we farmed and I was out of doors a great deal and I loved animals and often in that communion I, I sensed the divine. But when I didn't receive, uh, you know, the kind of rock-solid confirmation I was seeking, I nevertheless went on my mission. Maybe that wasn't an honest thing to do, but I think it was, it was the hopeful thing to do. And it was there um, in those early months when I uh, couldn't speak German and was um, 
coming to grips with uh, the law of the fast for the first time, which is something that had been really difficult to keep on the farm. My brother and I used to hide graham crackers in the toolbox <laughs> of the tractor <laughs> and, and bananas in the medicine cabinet of the dairy barn, and it was in that way that we kept ourselves alive during our teenage years. But on, our, on my mission, I had a, a devoted companion, and we began to fast one day and sometimes two days at a time. And uh, there, were, there came a time when uh, we had made enough of a fuss in a neighborhood in Frankfurt, Germany, that the local Lutheran pastor called a meeting to warn against the Mormon missionaries that were proselytizing. I related this actually in the PBS special, but I'll just briefly touch on it again because it is fundamental to my, my encounter with the divine. And a night came when the meeting was held, and, the, I, and my, my uh, German at the time was very rudimentary, so I'm, I'm repeating what I learned secondhand through my companion. But apparently the pastor said that we were working in the neighborhood, we were good young men, but that they had Luther, and they had the Bible, and they had no need for Joseph Smith in the Book of Mormon. So be nice to them, but be dismissive. And then he asked if there was anyone who wanted to comment, and my companion raised his hand. We were way at the back of the church, and he was permitted to come forward, and he brought me. And uh, he, again by his account, told them that uh, we appreciated Luther, and we believed deeply in the Bible, but that there was more. And then he bore his testimony about the Restoration, and then he invited me to do the same. And I can, I can remember that moment uh, with great clarity, because I remember not really having enough German at my command to say much that would have been intelligible or impressive, but I remember being helped and putting together the first, I think, honest-to-goodness testimony of my life. And I can remember in venturing into that unknown, stepping just into an area where I began to say, I know, having those comments, as I said them, confirmed in my heart in a very uh, noticeable, tangible, spiritual way, which I've always been grateful for because uh, from that moment on, really, I've never I've never seriously doubted the essential truth claims of the Church. And I've been willing, as has my wife, to stake our lives, the course of our lives, the decisions that we've made on those truths and on that, that impression and then subsequent impressions that have added to that. So that's where it really began for me, probably at somewhat of a late stage, 19 years of age. but but in a very tangible, spiritually memorable moment. Many people in the church began with spiritual foundations. They had conversion experiences, episodes of contact with some revelatory source, and yet find themselves being disaffected, falling away. <clears throat> Increasingly, history becomes a, a source of contention and, and disaffection. I want to talk a little bit about the relationship between history and faith, history and testimony. And <clears throat> I'm going to I'm going to provide a kind of defense in part of, of, of wedding the two. But then I want you to push back a little and, 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 and critique this. It strikes me, because I've, I've often wondered why, how did we get to the point that Joseph Smith becomes the centerpiece of our faith? Lutherans don't have to believe in Luther or his story. Right? Calvinists don't have to believe in John Calvin there. You don't have to believe in Wesley's conversion experience. But it strikes me that it goes back to that moment in Joseph's own narrative when he says, I, I realized that I could not settle the question by an appeal to the Bible. And I've read that a hundred times, but it was only when, when I read it fairly recently that I realized what that sentence represents is a repudiation of the whole Protestant project, right? Because all of Protestantism is founded on the notion of sola scriptura, all we need That's true. are the scriptures. And that was the moment when Joseph said, no, 
look around. Obviously, scriptures can't resolve this problem. And so that's the moment at which one has to find an alternative source of authority. And the source of authority becomes Joseph's revelatory experiences through which he receives priesthood and keys. And so, as I see it, that would be one way of defending the proposition that, as, as Richard Bushman has said, for Mormons, our history is our theology. On the other hand, as your own experiences so beautifully illustrate, um, and as the Book of Mormon teaches, right, any sure foundation has to be built on Christ. It has to be built on an experience of the divine, not on a series of historical propositions. That's true. So where do we find the proper balance? What role should our history have in our, in our spiritual formation and underpinnings to our testimonies? You know, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that I uh, see a need to, um, I guess it's really what Richard Bushman said. I don't see a need to divide our history from our theology because <coughs> I think in a sense they are one and the same. I, uh, I guess, let me explain it this way. A year ago in our state conference, a young, bright mother stood and talked about um, having done her daily scripture read and then was just sitting quietly thinking about what she had read and then began to reflect on the entire restoration and Joseph Smith. And then there came into her mind the question, what if all of this isn't real? What if it isn't real? And, and then she progressed from there to thoughts about our Savior and, and the fall and all of these beliefs that we have as Latter-day Saints and began again to question. And at, up until that point, she'd had a life much like the rest of, at least like most Latter-day Saints, a series of, of progressive um, experiences confirming what she believed and, and then had the lived experience of, uh, you know, by this, you can tell if it's my doctrine or if I speak, or God's doctrine or if I speak of myself, if you, it's the experiential part of this. If any man will do the will of the Father, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. So, so she at that point got into what I would call a spiritual free fall which I think is happening to many good Latter-day Saints today. And I think the way I reason through that in my humble way gets to what you're talking about. And that is, uh, ultimately, it all centers on Christ. I mean, what we sincerely in our hearts think about Him, believe about Him, hope about Him, is going to determine the kind of person that we'll be, I think and what our actions are going to be. And so when I look at this world and I, I ask the question, where is Christ? Who, who has him? Who is living like him? Who's being taught his teachings? Where is it facilitated to do what he did? I, I'm led to our church. That's, that's where I come, is to this church. And so that fact, <laughs> however it got there, <laughs> To me, if, if someone looks at the New Testament and is trying to find the Christianity that was practiced there, taught there, written about there in the book of Acts, he will eventually, I think, in a thoughtful way, come to Mormonism and will embrace the Christ of the Restoration and with that takes <laughs> those historical facts that, you know, that brought that all to pass. That's where I come out in my thinking on this. You mentioned the phrase, the Christ of the Restoration. And I love that phrase. It's not one that I hear a lot. And uh, I remember when I was writing on the subject of atonement and wanted to know, so what did Joseph actually say about atonement? And I can't find that he ever used the term. He never gave a sermon on the atonement. And so I, I began to wonder, well, is there, is there a different Mormon Christ? 
um, is there a Christ of the Restoration that is significantly different than the ones depicted in the creeds? And, and the more I've studied the question, the more I'm convinced, absolutely, absolutely. Um, um, I, I think as one example, I love the verse in the Book of Mormon that says he, that Christ doeth not anything save it be for the benefit of the world. This, this, this centering of human welfare as the focus of God and Christ's divine activity from the very beginning, from eons before the earth was formed, seems to me a pretty significant way of establishing the foundations of a theology rather than introducing Christ at that moment when there's been a catastrophic failure in a plan and suddenly we need a, a rescuer. So I think there is, but I, I get the sense that too often we've inherited um, traditions of the fathers and we buy into theological ideas and presuppositions that, that aren't ours and that we need to do more to clear the ground to see to see exactly how different the Christ was that Joseph was reintroducing. You know, I, I totally agree. And I think one of the challenges is, um, uh, I mean, the Savior said, this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I think we're very good sometimes as Latter-day Saints, uh, learning about God, learning about Christ. Uh, but there's, there's a knowledge, there's an understanding, I think, that comes from what might be called acquaintance. And uh, I know in trying to rear our family, uh, we were very heavy on agency. We wanted them to understand that uh, only when you choose to do good of your own free will are you going to obtain the reward. The reward is, in my opinion, spiritual growth, maturation, the internalization of the gospel as your own. You know, the articles of faith change from being we believe to I believe, and I think that's brought about by uh, consciously choosing to live in certain ways. All of that I think, uh, motivated and focused on Christ. And through, you know, through acts, through, through service, acts of service, acts of compassion, through acts of prayer, acts of fasting, um, acts of scriptural study and reflection, I think all of those things help us to come to know God and Christ not, not about them. We can write about them, talk about them, debate about them, and heaven only knows the world does that a lot. But to have an experience with them, to feel, to have an awareness that God is aware of me, to feel that uh, he has heard my cries, that, that I'm forgiven of a sin, those experiences are priceless, and I think they're at the heart of, of the restored gospel and the Christ and the God of the restoration. I think they're that personal. Why, why are we not more successful as a people in, in rooting testimony in that kind of encounter with Christ? You know, because if you listen to the language of testimonies, right, people don't stand up and say, right, I was converted when I met Christ on the way to Damascus. It's true. No, I was converted when I prayed about the Book of Mormon or about Joseph Smith. So, do we do we need to kind of recalibrate how how we are how how we are forming spiritual integrity in the church? Yeah, I think there may be a recalibration underway. I mean, it's like you point out, and Joseph said very little of anything about the atonement. Very little, if anything, was said about it in my youth. I don't think I ever had a lesson on it. I don't think I was aware of it as a doctrine even to speak of. Uh, you know, it was maybe in the, in the 1980s that we began to, to talk about and write about these things in the church. Uh, I, I think, how can I say this? Um, I, th I think there is a need, and I think it's a justified need based on on the church's doctrine, I think there is a need to somehow encourage 
greater um, spirituality, uh, maybe even overt spirituality. I think there's, there can be a hesitancy to do that in the church. I think sometimes, as you know, early in the history of the church, there was a spiritualism movement that got away with some yeah. and got away from the church in a way. And um, I think often about that word temperance. We don't use it much anymore, but it's in the fourth section. It's one of the attributes we're to have. And it doesn't just refer to an anti-alcohol campaign. It, it refers, I think, to the spiritual balance that we need. You know, the, the eighth section says, I will tell you in your heart and in your mind. I think we have these centers of reason and of feeling, and I think both need to be appealed to, to have what could be called maybe a complete uh, conviction of the gospel. And we've probably done a better job appealing to, to the mind in some ways than we have to the heart. It's a cerebral religion. That's true. It is a cerebral religion. I mean, this is one thing Oxford University Press learned. <laughs> it's one, it's that Mormons read books. <clears throat> and that's one reason why there's such a, right, a burgeoning in, mm. of, of, of lines of Mormon studies in the press. This is what one of the senior editors at Oxford told me. She said, we discovered Mormons, they devour their history. Yeah. <clears throat> so let me ask you, how, how have you, <clears throat> this is a personal question, introduced and I hate to, I'm reluctant to use the word mystical because that has its own connotations, but sometimes I think that we almost need a little more mysticism, um, more of an encounter of, with the divine. You know, we use and overuse the word awesome so that everything's awesome, but in its original use, that's a feeling, that feeling of awe that we should have. It isn't a feeling that pushes God away, I don't think. It, it, it brings us closer because we are in awe. We're in awe of his love, of his power, of his interest in us. And, you know, to experience that, to feel that more often than we do, and to, and to have some mechanism to create that. I'd love your thoughts on that as widely as you've read. Well, two ideas have really, really shaped my spiritual practice, I guess I would say. And one is section 10 of the Doctrine and Covenants, beginning with about verse 52, where the Lord, this is given in 1829, of course, and the Lord is speaking to Joseph Smith about his church, and he's referring to a church already in existence. So you have to ask, what, what church, church is this? Because mm -hmm. he's, he's talking about the Restoration and he's saying, I'm, I'm not doing this to do away with my church, and I don't want my church to be panicked by what's about to happen. And that's the moment at which you become aware that, that Joseph really understood this idea of an invisible church that transcends any particular denominational category. <clears throat> and so it's my understanding based on that, based on... Uh, the Lord's reference to holy men ye know not of, mm -hmm. that he recognized. The Doctrine and Covenants' own description of the church as those who will repent and have him to be their God. So I believe that, that we should and can, and I have, felt part of this larger spiritual community. And that's not to downplay the unique significance of the Restoration as the repository of saving keys and ordinances. Or the way I would put it, I think Joseph Smith was suggesting that, that the church, the institutional church, is the portal of salvation. It's not the reservoir of the righteous. And so I, that's helped me to open myself to being taught by some of the masters of the spiritual tradition. You know, the Julian of Norwich and the Edward Beechers and the Gregory of, of Nazianzus. And, you know, they're, they're sprinkled throughout history, these beautiful, beautiful souls who have so much to teach us. About, about the consecrated life. Um, That's true. I remember reading Thomas Merton's uh, Seven Story Mountain at, uh, I think just shortly after I got back from my mission and being so impressed with his, his drive as a person to find God, experience God. It is very motivating. It doesn't all come from within 
the church. It doesn't. For sure. It doesn't. Oh. Um, I remember doesn't. reading uh, an oration of Gregory of Nazianzus, and uh, in the course of his testifying of Christ, he apologizes for being overcome by emotion mm. at contemplating the suffering of the Christ. And I think, how can we doubt the, the devotion and goodness of, of such figures from the past? So I, I appreciate the institutional forms and structures for how they help us to raise families and, and give us additional scriptures and, and provide all these resources. It reminds me of a conversation I had with uh, a member of the church in, in Stockholm who was struggling with his faith and was, while we were there, he was hosting us. He was trying to make the decision whether to stay or whether to leave. And he had a whole list of grievances and complaints. <clears throat> and I remember thinking, um, you know, it's not gonna really do to just kind of engage these one by one by one. And so finally, I, I thought to just ask him this question. I said, do you believe that in the restoration as you experience it, you have all of the spiritual resources necessary to secure salvation for you and your family? And he said, well, yes. <laughs> I said, well, then what's the problem? <laughs> and, and I think that's a question that we need to ask ourselves more often is, is uh, you know, it's like my son says, the church isn't a Swiss army knife. It's not supposed to have a, <laughs> right, a, a, an aspect that fulfills every, every need in our lives, but it gives us those resources, the indispensable instruments to secure our reunion with the Father and, and the human society, but, um, and that's helped me to put history in, into a kind of perspective, which I think is a healthier perspective. Very healthy. So, but you were, you were church historian during an utterly transformative moment. And when the history of the church is told a hundred years from now, this will be, right, it'll be these years that they'll say church history came of age. A kind of, a kind of good start under the Arrington years. Yes. Um, but then that was kind of aborted and then reinitiated. Can you talk a little bit about one of the, a couple of things I'd like to know. One is, did you experience it as a historic moment? Were you aware that, uh, that the ground was shaking underneath you? And, and the second question is, I'd like to, to know if there was more to it than just an inevitable response to mass media and the internet. Those are, those are really profound questions. I, I think I was aware uh, that we were in uh, the midst of something very, very unusual, very uh, transformative. Uh, I certainly had a headache every day, <laughs> if that's any indication of the stresses and strains of a period of time like that. But... Uh, Yes, I think in some in some respects, what happened uh, might have been inevitable, just because there was that convergence of um, digital technology. Uh, you know, everybody being networked through the World Wide Web, uh, someone being smart enough to figure out what a web crawler could do, and and the connectivity that came about in the entire world. Uh, and, and this is before the day of the smartphone, which is, you know, an era of its own. But um, aside from that, I think, and, and I, uh, again, I have a hard time viewing myself as being very instrumental in all of this. I, I'm, in some ways, I was a happy victim of circumstance. In some ways, I was uh, very blessed to... Uh, have as associates men and women who were very visionary. Uh, I know when I first became the church historian, people within the church history department kept asking me, what's your vision for our department? And I remember saying, I don't have a vision. You're going to help me create one. <laughs> and if I had a vision, I guess it was simply that I, I had a feeling that, uh, that within our archive, within our library, were some of the most precious I called them the, the jewels of the kingdom. Precious truths, stories, um, evidences of the truthfulness of the church. So and you didn't you didn't see it as a repository of hidden smoking guns. But <laughs> not, you're not saying it was was the contrary. Very much the contrary. I've I've 
again, it's just the nature, I suppose, that I've acquired, however, of openness, sometimes maybe to a fault. Uh, but I could, I could never see any benefit in, especially in the digital age, the information age. But in any age, I see no benefit into covering up. You know, truth is a knowledge of things as they were and as they are and as they are to come. And the Holy Ghost testifies of truth. Uh, he speaks of things as they really are and as they really will be. I believe that. I believe the best antidote we have for anyone's faith crisis is to tell the whole story and lay it out the way it, you know, the way it happened, the way we, th we think it happened, the best, to the best of our knowledge. I also think there was um, nothing happens in this church that the First Presidency and the Quorum of the Twelve don't approve of and, and in a sense, lead. Uh, you know, I was happily ensconced in the third tier of a three-tiered hierarchy. I felt very comfortable there. There was very little during those years that we did that we didn't advocate upline and receive approval for with complete uh, knowledge. And that's, that's actually a feeling of great security for a person who was in my circumstance. I think if, not to criticize Leonard Arrington at all, because he, he's unsurpassed in so many ways, but I don't think he quite understood, having come from an academic background and not having served the apprenticeship within the hierarchy of the church that I was blessed to serve, I don't think he appreciated the, I'll call it, correlated environment that we were in there, and just the necessary basis to touch and steps to take to make that all work. But once that got started and trust was established and we began to see the fruits of a, a policy of openness and complete transparency, I think it just carried itself along on its own power and it continues. Uh, just the other day, uh, the new comprehensive history of the church was announced. That was really the only idea I went into my office with was that we needed to upgrade what or update you know what yeah, brother tribes. roberts had done <clears throat> yes and to see that you know bear fruit now is a is a really uh, happy day for me and i think it will be for the entire church so can you think of any <clears throat> moments of surprise uh, in your experience there in the historian's department <clears throat> i guess i was i i had several moments of surprise i was surprised for instance when we went to the first presidency and asked uh, for the release of the of the uh, Andrew Jensen affidavits concerning the Mountain Meadows massacre. Those had never been released, and uh, it was at the time when when a book was being written by church employees about the Mountain Meadows massacre, and I felt like if we were going to write that, somewhat under church auspices, at least funded by the church, even though the authors had complete autonomy. We needed to, again to release everything we had uh, on the Mountain Meadows massacre. So when we went and requested that re those affidavits be released, uh, President Hinckley was the only member of the presidency that had read them, and he asked President Monson and President uh, Faust if they had, and they hadn't, but they quickly did, and then they quickly gave permission uh, on the on the basis that if we were going to tell that story, we needed to tell it with all that we had. Uh, that was a little bit of a surprise, and yet it, it sort of set the tone. Uh, just recently, the minutes of the Council of 50 have been published. Those, again, were sort of sacrosanct <laughs> documents that no one ever got to, and, and now they're out for the whole <laughs> public to read, and probably very few have read them. I remember, <laughs> as a member of the advisory, board, I was asked to review the Council of Fifty Minutes manuscript, and I was pretty excited the day that parcel came in the mail. I'm going to be one of the first to get—it was a pretty boring set of minutes. <laughs> That's true. There wasn't any, any body buried. No, no, <clears throat> no big discoveries there. Which, which leads to my next question. <clears throat> we commonly uh, acknowledge, it's been alleged, and there seems to be common acknowledgement, that the narrative of church history that has unfolded over recent years is a different narrative than we learned in primary and Sunday school. 
Do you think that's overstated, or is that is that the case? Is it a significantly different narrative we tell now, or that will be told in this new church history? You know, I think it's maybe a little overstated right now. Certainly, there are uh, there are certain facets of our history that haven't been completely told in the past. Polygamy being a prominent one, but uh, I don't I don't think. I don't think there was ever a wholesale attempt to, to spin our history. Yes, in those early years, we were in a more defensive mode, a more apologetic mode. And, you know, even within my own family, my youngest daughter has had one time said to me, Dad, why didn't you talk more about polygamy? And, and I, the honest answer was, because your mother wouldn't have appreciated that. But... <laughs> but uh, I think we we chose to emphasize the strengths, the what we felt were the more relevant parts of our history and our doctrine, to the neglect of some things that have come home to bite us a little bit because it appears now to some that they were covered over and uh, that there was some deliberate attempt made to to portray the church's history different than it was. And I, I don't believe in that theory. I think we... We've well, as you said, the First Presidency themselves, in most cases, weren't familiar with these original documents. That's true. That fill in details <clears throat> or missing, missing gaps. Yeah, I, I think I agree with you. I, I can understand. I, I think it's, it's not really excusable that we have so alighted the history of polygamy from Joseph Smith's experience in the church history. But other things, I still don't quite get why they matter. Like, I've, I've heard of people who have actually left the church when they discovered that Joseph used a peep stone and a hat. And somehow I'm trying to understand why it's more credible or respectable <laughs> to imagine Joseph wearing a Nephite breastplate with a long arm through giant spectacles. But looking at a seer stone and a hat somehow is a, I don't know, is a, a degradation of that idea or something. I, so I think some things matter a lot more than others. I agree. But it, and, and some of those things are very difficult for me to understand as well. I, I, I suppose there's a difference in, in everyone as far as their capacity to believe, to just be accepting of some things. I've always been grateful that I have a believing heart. My wife actually is much more questioning, much more curious in some ways than I am. Uh, and, I, and I've just never had that need. I've, I've enjoyed learning, but I've always been very accepting of of the truths that, as they were presented, so and nothing has ever pushed you to the precipice of doubt. Not, not, not really. I suppose following my mission when I went to BYU and began to become more intellectually aware, took some philosophy classes. Uh, I suppose my mind wandered, and <clears throat> I worked out different scenarios and what ifs. But no, I've never. I've never come close, and I've I've been thinking about that, um, and it comes back to the little, to the little uh, mother who asked, "What if all of this isn't real?" And uh, a scripture. It's interesting how, through life, you know, Joseph said, "Never had any scripture come with such force into the heart of man as that verse did to mine at that time," and. Um, I've gone through a succession of, of important scriptures for me, but right currently the most important scripture for me is the, is the little rhetorical question that Alma asks in Alma 32 when he's pointing out to us how faith increases and how, as he likened it to a seed, we begin to feel swelling motions. We begin to have these spiritual uh, impressions and experiences. And then sort of in mid-sentence he says, is not this real? And as I think about the restoration, as I think about Jesus as my Savior, I just have this assurity, this is real. This, this is real. And, uh, you know, if, if Sterling McMurrin wants to say that it, Angels just don't bring gold plates to young boys. I want to say to him, yes, they do. This is real. This is how it happened. 
And, and again, that, uh, those verses from Jacob where he talks about the Spirit speaking of things as they really are. I've often wondered, why would he modify with that word really? Things either are or they are not. How can they really be? Well, they can really be, I think, when the Spirit witnesses to us of their reality. There's nothing more real than that. And when people get in this spiritual free fall through their doubts and questions, I just want to say to them, hang on. There will be places you can grab. Hang on, because these things are real. I feel it, I think, most keenly at funerals, and I feel it in the temple, which is where I would say most of my mystical experiences occur as insights come to me. I had one come just the other day that I shared in the temple with my wife that was priceless to me. And so uh, that's, at least for me at the present moment, something that uh, provides a real firm foundation for my, my faith. Thank you. I'd like to wrap up with three questions. Okay. And you can answer them as briefly or as at great length as you choose. But <clears throat> what do Mormons do really well? You know, Mormons or the Mormon Church? You choose either one. Well, I think it's both. I think we... I think we... I think we center real well on the Savior. In our teachings, in our practices. I think there are millions of good Latter-day Saints who really are seeking to come unto Christ and to learn of Him and to do his works. Uh, I feel it, you know, on a, on a uh, micro scale in my, my little country ward uh, almost every week. I feel that happening in lives. I think that's something we do very well. I think as an offshoot of that, we do, uh, we do humanitarian. Uh, things very well. I think there's a, there's a service ethic that we, hopefully because of our belief in Christ and our desire to do unto the least of these my brethren, uh, I think we do that well. We do it institutionally, but I think just individually, this Just Serve program that the church has inaugurated, it's amazing. The opportunities that are published and, uh, and then the people who act of their own free will every week and just going out and doing good in the community somewhere, unattached to the church at all. I think we do that very well. And what don't we do so well yet? <laughs> you know, this goes back to my youth. I don't think we do well by those that don't fit our norms. The young man who doesn't serve a mission or who comes home early. The the person struggling with same-gender attraction, um, the divorced woman, uh, those who are different. I, I think it's, if, you've, if you meet the norm, if you're striving for the ideal and, and uh, coming close to it, I think Mormonism is a glorious place to be. If you're, if you're not, if you're in some in-between state where you don't quite fit, I don't think we've learned yet quite how to bring that is person that, in. Is that an institutional or a personal failing? I think it's both. <clears throat> I really do think it's both. Uh, I still, I mean, I think we have some racism in our, in our ranks. I think it's still difficult for some people to embrace all races. So I, I, I think, I think the solutions have got to, in part, be created by the church, but I think they've also got to be a part of each of our hearts as we figure out ways to love and include and make everyone feel welcome and loved within our, our tent. I don't know that we're doing that very well yet. Last question. Okay. Describe your holy envy of <laughs> some other faith tradition's practice, idea, teaching. <clears throat> Holy envy, what a great term. 
That was Krister Stendhal, who was former Buffett. dean at Harvard Divinity School, who uh, used that expression. Interesting. Uh, you know, just out of my own experience, I guess I would have to say that, in a way, I have always envied the uh, group of Trappist monks who inhabit the monastery in the little valley where I live. They take vows of celibacy, silence, and poverty. And their order is a contemplative order. They're not trying to serve mankind, they're trying to pray for mankind. And out of that strength of prayer to help the world. And as I've come through the years to associate and observe them in their a strict observance of their vows, I have seen a holiness. They eat very healthily, they work very rigorously, there's a love and unity among them, there are common purposes that they've enjoyed uh, commercially and otherwise to make their monastery go. But the end result has always been a clarity of of eye, a radiance of countenance, and a um, just a, a deep humility for life, for other people, for God's blessings that uh, that I've envied. I've I've wondered, you know, in my life whether I've. Uh, come as far in my spiritual development, and I realize that they've they've missed many of the great experiences that can produce, you know, a more sterling character, such as marriage and family life. But I, I do envy the degree of their purity and their holiness, in a sense, as men. However, that came about in that order. Elder Jensen, thank you for your words and your life and for gifting us with your time today. Terrell, thank you for giving me this chance. Uh, I've, I've long admired you, read almost everything you've written, and feel uh, very honored to be a part of this effort that you're making this summer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.